changing the world of work for women everywhere. We are Watermark. We're the only nonprofit women's leadership organization that spans all industries. We connect, develop, and advocate for the advancement of women in the workplace. The Watermark community includes senior executives, entrepreneurs, and emerging executives that support you not only at the top of your field, but also on your way up. Uh, Rachel O'Meara is on fire. She has just <laughs> wrote an article for the New York Times, interviewed live by the Wall Street Journal, <coughs> written for the Harvard Business Review. She wrote a little book. <laughs> and I can guarantee she's going to be a bestseller. There's no doubt about it. I so enjoyed this. And most of all, I just love her honesty. To be able to be so candid to talk about a tough time she had in her career that led to a life-changing experience. Uh, for many of us, the thought of taking a pause seems so scary and, and career suicide. But Rachel has a completely different view on it and I think a really smart one. So. Very, very excited to hear from you. Please help me, Rachel O'Meara. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right. So I mic'd in two directions. I've got mics for video cameras and mics for the room and slides and some books. And so welcome. It's great to see all of you here. As Mary mentioned, uh, GPAWS, the, the Google version of a mindfulness club, where we help each other and take time to have sits. Who here is from the GPAWS community? Just to show of hands, there might be a few of you. All right, thank you for coming. Julie's here in front, awesome. Who's here from the Women at SF group? Anyone here from that? All right, in the back row, yeah, you're here representing, great. Uh, yeah, so I'm in both of those groups, and, and I was really lucky and happy to have the GPAWS community say, yes, we will support and fund the food. So yay, we have food. We're mindfully eating it. It's awesome. So <laughs> who's with me? Yeah, go food. All right, well, I'm so excited. So I uh, have a book out, as you've heard, pause, and it's here. It's been two weeks out in the market. And I actually was here hosting Jenny Blake about, I don't know, about, it was in November, so four or five months ago. Was anyone here for that? Everybody, some people remember that? Okay, so I introduced Jenny. And uh, so for those of you who know or don't know Jenny, Jenny's actually one of my pause stories as well in pause. <laughs> so I have about 12 people I feature case studies in. And so her world where she was at Google, I feel like her book Pivot is the cousin to pause, where it's really a similar story of how you can shift and pivot or intentionally shift your behavior like in pause. And so it's been, a, been awesome to kind of like follow in her footsteps a little bit. And I've always been a fan of, of hers, but also just she's been a tremendous uh, influence on me and the book as she's in it too. So all you Jenny Blake fans out there, you might want to also look at her story in here because it's about how she took off her time at Google and did her book tour for her first book, Life After College, which she talked about. So I'm going to read a little bit just to get started, and I won't read any more, but I was thinking about this, and uh, I think pausing is about living in the moment, right? So it's not about having a lot of plans. So I literally was putting this deck together, and it's also procrastination, uh, a couple hours ago. And, and, and so some of the slides are new, and I haven't done them before, but I'm really excited. I think it's going to be a really fun and engaging time together, and we're going to learn a lot. So this is what I'll read for you, and this is the dedication to pause. So if you have the book, you can follow along on the first page. And I, I, uh, a lot of people ask me who I dedicate the book to, and the book I dedicate is literally to all of you, to all of you who are here. Because for those who give themselves permission to pause, you're here at this event. This is pausing, in my opinion. You're intentionally shifting your behavior for the transformers and those on their way to being and becoming you, <laughs> me. This book is about discovering for yourself what psychiatrist, existentialist, and Holocaust survivor Viktor Frankl stated so clearly, one of my heroes. S between stimulus and response, there is a pause. There is a space, sorry. <laughs> it's kind of a pause. In that space is our power to choose our response. In that response lies our growth and our freedom. Who's heard that before? 
it's like a pretty famous quote, yeah, from um, uh, Man's Search for Meaning. So in that space is the power of pause. And so uh, I've studied Viktor Frankl a lot, and it's true. I think what he talks about is exactly what the premise of the book that I wrote is, where literally pausing is shifting your behavior, but with intention and allowing space for what isn't there yet to emerge, whether it's a thought or an idea or an emotion or a new way of being or a risk. All of those things, I think, are ways that work well to pause. So we're going to get into that tonight. And I uh, have a couple of things I'm going to share first. <laughs> so this is, this, is, uh, this, is, this slide stayed in. I, I, I've used it before. And I think what's important is this is really worlds colliding. So who's felt in a, at some point in your life where your worlds have collided? You just have had something happening on one end. Yeah, it was like half the room said yes. And, half the, and, then, and then you've got something else completely separate, but you're kind of juggling two things or not sure how they're going to work together. And then, bam, there's a collision, and in a good way. So this is my version of when <laughs> shit gets real. You can, you can uh, bloop, that, bloop that out later. But literally, uh, I found this meme on the internet. It's, it's not by me, but it, you know, two of my favorite things, Stormtroopers, I'm a Star Wars geek, and uh, Muppets. I'm a Muppet maniac, uh, self-recovering Muppet maniac from the 80s. Uh, I, 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 like, this is perfect. This is me in my world of Google, where I've been working for nine years, and pause, which I've been writing for five years. And so really, I'm like bringing these together in a way. And here we are at Google tonight. And I've spoken at Google now and, and doing different tours and speaking. And, and uh, what's cool is I think worlds colliding is a good thing. And it doesn't necessarily need to be a scary thing. And, and so that's kind of like my message here is that if you do feel like you've got some worlds colliding, it's not a bad thing. It's kind of just allowing those things to be together maybe in a way they weren't before, like stormtroopers with Muppet heads. You know, I think that's, that's a very common thing I see a lot of. <laughs> so what are we going to talk about tonight? Well, we've got a lot of time. We're going to get into some really cool stuff about what pausing can be and the signs you know you need a pause. But I think first it's really just about being present and being in the practice. And I, I try to live this all the time. It's not easy. I definitely do not live it all the time. But I think this is kind of my, my principle. So the practice of pause, and we can all embrace this tonight, right here, right now, is to have some fun. So it's about engaging with others. Who are you? Like, tell me about you. What, what does that mean, whether it's in the happy hour or we're going to do some fun exercises? Asking questions. So this is a QA. and a We're going to have a ton of stuff to talk about. And I want to hear what your questions are. So feel free to ask them. And then share and connect and, and then learn more. So there's a ton of tools in the book. And has anyone actually read the book yet? I know it's only been out two weeks, but <laughs> OK, a couple of hands. Yay, thank you, thank you. And uh, there's a lot. So we're not going to cover nearly anything, like probably about 20% of the book or so if we can. But there's a lot in there. And I encourage you guys to, uh, to look into it. We've got a good deal as well in the back. It's, I think, two for $27 and one for 16 And I'm going to stay after and sign them all, of course. So what are we going to do? So this is, uh, I know you know a little bit about the evening, but I think it's important to start with how it all began, which is my story. And then walk through a couple of the different things, how you can recognize the signs that you know you need a pause. Huge important thing to know. Types of pauses you can have. So again, I define a pause as any intentional shift in behavior. So it doesn't have to be some long, epic journey or anything like that. It can be literally a breath. Let's all do that now. Just kind of get here and arrive. Yeah. We'll look at yearnings. And this is work that I've been doing in my studies at the Wright Foundation. So we're going to get into that, do some fun exercises. And then tools that you can use along with ways that you can, what I like to call mental flossing, just like dental flash, kind of get in there and get the gunk out with some beliefs you might be having and not wanting to continue. And then why does all this matter anyway? What, what does that mean? And what do we want to create for, your, for ourselves so that we have a pause plan and you can actually walk out of here with hopefully a few ideas and a few ways that you can implement what we talk about today immediately? And that's the beauty of a pause. I think anyone can do it. And it's a matter of your intention and what works for you. So that's what we're going to cover. All right, so let's start with my story. <laughs> I think this is an important one. And, and I know not a lot of you have read the book, but I, uh, I'm, I'm excited to share this story because I think it's a, <clears throat> I think we all relate. I, I, I would expect and think a lot of us can relate to 
what, what my situation was about five years ago, so I was working at Google. Like I said, I've been here nine years. And I was in a job as a customer support manager. And I was managing about 11 people. And I'd been in the role about six months. And for whatever reason, <laughs> things weren't going my way. I would show up really working to do something and make a difference, like wanting to have some impact, as we say at Google. And I wasn't. I was getting these signals and feedback from my, ma my manager and from my team that, that what I was doing wasn't going well. Maybe it was communicating and not being succinct and direct. That was some feedback that I got. Maybe it was my executive presence, and I really wasn't really solid and and clear with my messages with someone who might be more senior than me, or maybe my peer, or maybe a report. So I had a lot of feedback that just continued to come my way. And, and I would register it, but I also kind of pushed it aside, I think, at that point, where I was like, well, maybe that was just today. <laughs> or I would say, oh, my manager doesn't really understand, and she'll get it. Like, I'll, I'll keep doing what I'm doing, and everything will work out. And it certainly wasn't for a lack of effort. But who can relate to that story? Has anyone ever been in those shoes a little bit? Yeah, so I know I wasn't alone in this. And uh, this continued for maybe about two months. And I would go home every night and just be miserable and sad and cry and just tell my boyfriend at the time, I don't know what's going on. I can't do this anymore, but I'm just feeling burned out. And this isn't sustainable. I'm not running in a way that works for me. And my manager would tell me that she felt like a broken record every time we sat down. And I was trying to take it in and be very disciplined and learn. And then I'd go back and do something, and then something would fail. I wouldn't work out the way that I wanted it to. So this, this was me hitting my head against the wall face, <laughs> I would say. And, uh, and I think that that was OK at the time, but I knew things needed to change. I wasn't happy. So I thought about what to do, and I had this really really like bottom line conversation with my manager, Margaret, at the time. And I literally was with her. This is in the book, this conversation, because it was so important. She's like, this job isn't a fit for you. And you need to figure out another plan. What do, you, what do you want? You could stay in the role, but it's just not a fit. Maybe you can get better at it. Great. But, but like you may not. And then you might have a performance plan. And we'll get better. But really, she kind of was giving me the message, I think, that as a hint, as a friend, this isn't, the, this isn't the fit for you that you want to continue doing. And so I took that to heart. This was a Friday afternoon in April. It's about this time, actually. And so I went home that evening with this dilemma. Like, what do I do? And I liked Google. I didn't want to quit. But I was like, maybe I quit. And maybe that's better. And, and so kind of hem and hawed about it. And then the following day, I had a conference call with a couple girlfriends. And my girlfriends and I were Skyping, and they, they were out of town. And one of them actually mentioned, well, have you thought about the Google sabbatical program? <laughs> I was like, no. They have a sabbatical program? I didn't know that. And so it was like the, a good example of being in the constant fear of the, of the mental chatter that I just didn't even have any capacity to think outside of my negative mindset that was slowly in a tailspin not going anywhere, where I was just continually feeding myself thoughts of failure and not doing well and back and forth on that. So of course, my ears picked up and perked up. And then I looked and researched it. And sure enough, there was this leave of absence program. And so I spent that weekend researching how I would take a three-month unpaid break, which was the maximum amount of time I could take. And I had to get approvals. And I had to make sure it would work for my team and myself. And so that's kind of what happened. And then the following Monday, I sat down with my manager and laid out the plan. I had researched it. I, did a, I think I did a great job of coming up with all of the information. And she was as surprised as I had been, didn't know we had the program at the time. And she said, <laughs> oh, well, let me take it to uh, HR. And maybe we'll, maybe this can work. I don't know. But, I'm open to that. And I'd been at DoubleClick and Google for a, a long time already, so it was already established that I'd been there. And that was my case. I was kind of saying, I've been here a while, and I, I do feel like I am a fit. But yeah, like you said, I'm not a fit for the role. So what if I took this break? And so we had some terms, of course. I wanted to take the break the next day. <laughs> I wanted to just get out of Dodge. 
And so she said, well, hold on a second. Uh, actually, we need to do a couple things before that if it does get approved, like fill for your role. So we need to get a new person you need to hire and train before you leave. And then the idea will be you won't come back to the role and we'll, you can find a new job in Google. You have a quarter to do that. And those were the terms. And I, I was like, OK, I have to stay a little longer. But I think that's doable. And so that's what happened. And I ended up getting a person in the role and training them. And then off I went in June of that year of 2011 for my three-month unpaid break. And literally felt like a, a, a schoolgirl out of school. Like, oh my god, what am I going to do with my time? And really scary. And, and all of a sudden, I had these mental mind maps of not doing well. Like I mentioned, my, my, my mental head at the time was really not healthy, where I just felt like a failure a lot. And, and it wasn't for a lack of effort. So, so what I decided was to take that time and really go into what did I need to change? Because this clearly wasn't working. And maybe, maybe my whole career is a farce. Maybe I'm not meant to be in technology. Maybe I'm not meant to be at Google. I think I'm kind of smart. I don't know. But I don't know what I need right now other than this time. So it can relate to that. It's kind of like, what's the going on? Yeah, and I think I know there's a lot of women in the room. And, and I think uh, all of us have come into that, whether it's a, a life change or family or kids and all of that. So I completely get that and it resonates even though I'm not a, a parent. So that's a little bit of the preface of the story. And uh, when I took the break, it was really just more about me recovering, refresh and renew and get back on my two feet so that when I did come back, and I didn't know I was coming back to Google either, by the way. So that was a choice I made about halfway through my, t my pause. And so I came back and I did find a job and it was a sales role that was based on a whole bunch of information that I discovered about myself while on my pause, like my strengths. And I took the strength finders test and assessment, rather. And, uh, and came back just with renewed purpose, really, of like, I know that this is a fit for me. Google and I have very similar values. And I think I could find something there. I really need to be diligent and, and intentional about it. And so I'm still in sales, actually. And uh, I'm on a three-week pause right now, so it's kind of fun. And I'm back for the talk. <laughs> so that's my story in a, in a condensed nutshell of sorts. And we can ask questions later. But I want to take you through, in hindsight, I see the signs on the wall that happened to me. And you may recognize some of these. And I'll go through these. And what I would ask you to do is mentally track in your head, if, like give yourself a point, a one, for any of these that may have happened to you if you're thinking about any intentional shift in behavior can be an extended break, but it definitely doesn't have to be. So OK, the five signs. So the first sign, and these all happened to me. The first sign is you used to love your job, and now you loathe it. Hmm, yes, that one is a big one. But the truth is, you, it's very true. You might have loved your job, and, and I think it's all in us that we want to do our best and succeed. And then all of a sudden, if things aren't working out, something has shifted. And, we aren't really sure what it is, but it's a clear sign that things can be different. And it might be you. <laughs> it might be the wake-up call you need. And it might be a time to reassess your path or shift how you show up at work or be responsible for what maybe wasn't in your realm before. And so I invite that one as a, as a big sign, actually. Because uh, you, you only know as your own person, am I, am, I am I, like it could be loathing, but it might just be not satisfied either. And it doesn't mean quit, by the way. This is just a sign. The second sign is that uh, your boss tells you it's not working out. So this happened to me, too. <laughs> and uh, has anyone had this sign? I like this one. This is like, oh, yes, I've had that. So yeah, I think this is an important one, too. But it could be really subtle. It might just be in the hallway, kind of a passive remark by a coworker, like, are you sure you're happy here? You know, they know what you're going through. Or it could be your boss literally sitting you down on a one-on-one -on -one like me and saying, this isn't a fit. <laughs> it could be, I call it the proverbial pink slip. But it could be in a range of that. The third sign is that you have a technology intervention. So who can relate to this one? But maybe by, by this, I mean <laughs> you feel like you're tethered to your devices a little more than you should. Or you might be not able to, yeah, there are the hands are going up. Uh, you might be able to connect, but then it's really hard to disconnect. And maybe there's some boundaries there that could be created uh, that could help you be more satisfied and not be, un not be so tethered. And in my case, I had a friend, same friend from the, from the Skype call, say, 
Will, like, why are you always on your e email? It was literally this direct question, and I got it on day one of my pause heading up to Sonoma. And uh, I was like, oh, yeah, I guess I am. And is this my intervention? And she laughed, and I laughed because it really was. But it was my other wake-up call that I was on my email, and two feet away from me, friends would be talking or chatting or uh, in a conversation that I wasn't a part of because I chose to work. And, and so that was a, that's a big sign. So there's ways you can create a digital device pause where you can influence how you work with your own phones or internet and social media and all of that stuff. But there's little things you can do to shift, and it, and it makes a remarkable difference. So whether that intervention comes from yourself, where you say, wow, what the heck is going on? My, my neurons are firing. I can't put this Instagram down, or if it's a colleague or a loved one who just says, you know, what, what you can't keep Checking your email at dinner, because <laughs> that's not working for us. So those are all options. So who can relate to that one now that I've explained it a little bit? I know, this one is huge. And we're going to talk about how the chemicals in our brain work on that a little bit from, a, um, from the wants. So the fourth sign is that you have a challenge. So this one is a pretty obvious one, but it's an adversity or a challenge you face. So maybe this is a death in the family, like big deal stuff or cancer, or maybe it's a loss of a job. You got laid off. Big problems there, too. It's like, oh, the disasters have hit. And so the reality is this actually might be a blessing in disguise. And in future opportunity, although it seems like nothing like that now, could be an opportunity. And so instead of muscling through something or denying we're in pain or hurt, we can choose to pause <laughs> and, and actually shift how we are and acknowledge what's going on if it is something that isn't feeling great. That's the challenge. And then the last sign, I hope you're keeping track of all these, by the way. The last sign is that you do have an opportunity, an opportunity knocks, where it might be the, 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 the friend who's whispered in your ear all these years to go on that vacation with you. It might be the job you want to start or the passion project that you've always been putting off. These are ways that this shows up. And so, that's what I mean by an opportunity. So it could be in any one of those. So kind of taking inventory now. So those were the five signs. You used to love your job, you lo now you loathe it. You have a, um, your boss tells you it's not working out. Inven the uh, technology intervention, challenge, or opportunity. So I'm just going to take an anonymous poll here. Who here has had uh, one, one of those signs? Just leave your hands up. OK, yeah, so like two thirds of the room at least. Actually, I'm, I'm going to say almost everybody has their hand up. What about two signs? Leave your hands up. And this is right now, by the way. Like we can say this is happening now. Uh, three signs. Four signs. Five signs. <clears throat> yeah, so this is common. And look around the room. It's not like we're all alone, but we do feel like that, I think, a lot of the time. So those five signs are always good to be aware of because I think they are cues. I missed all of them, <laughs> all of them. And, and, uh, and that's why I did take my pause. But my key message, one of the ones tonight, is if you can tune in and know one of those is going on in the moment, you can kind of say and be more aware and say, well, hold on a second. What's happening here? Am I, am I going in a direction that is working for me? Can I pause? Can I intentionally shift my behavior? And maybe that means I create a rule around my digital devices if it happens to be the technology intervention. You don't have to have an intervention, by the way, to do that. So that's the five signs. And then I think that also leads into what types of pauses you can have. So I mentioned this already. But being here is a pause. I mentioned that, an intentional shift in behavior. And I write about a lot of different ways to pause. And I think the digital device pause is one that I've started sharing already tonight. So if you find yourself tethered to your email box, inbox like I was or not able to put down a phone when you want to, uh, you're, you're enabled and empowered as a person, as a choice maker, to create boundaries for yourself. And so maybe it's a simple rule you create. And I'm a big fan of rules. I, I made a lot of them during my pause to kind of create some structure because it really was a challenge to just have all this free time, which is important if you're coming from a corporate environment for sure, or any environment that has rules, which is most places. So not sleeping with your phone in the room, right? That's a big one. And I see some smiles. Having uh, a rule, I have a new one where I, I don't want to check social media. I, I don't check social media on, the, on, on weekends. And that's a little different with the pause launch. But <laughs> I've been, the weekends I do it, I'm, no, I'm noticeably more 
uh, just more present and happier because I'm not like, what's going on now? <sighs> <laughs> so, so those are important. And then uh, other types of pauses, I have, a, I have a whole list of things called daily pauses. And the whole idea is that this isn't stuff that you need a lot of time for. These are ways you can create different ways of being in, in your daily life. So how many of you have a meditation or a mindfulness practice today? OK, so a lot of you, yeah, like maybe, maybe two thirds of the room does, which is great. So you're already well aware of how you can incorporate daily daily pauses. And I consider that one way to pause, but I also think there's a lot more that can be done where it might be, uh, you might tune in with how you're feeling in the moment, which is great, but really settling in to know what that is right now. You can ask yourself right now, this is a pause moment, like what, am I, what, are, what primary emotion am I feeling? And uh, just noticing that, it's like a big deal. We don't stop to do that. I have other pauses where you can create a um, like walk around the block pause. So this is a really simple, obvious one, but literally just a set intention to say, I'm going to walk around and I'm going to really notice every color I see. I'm going to notice the textures on the ground. I'm going to look at people's eyes, even if they think I'm crazy. You know, these are like little things, but they matter. And they, they actually can induce a way to, to pause. and. We'll get into yearnings in a little bit, but, but that's important. There's one we'll do right now, which I think is a really good one. And, and uh, these are called micro mindfulness pauses. Uh, what about micro mindfulness pauses? He did a PhD on pausing. So I had to put him in the book. I mean, I met him at Wisdom 2.0. And so he has this one where you can hold up a palm. So go ahead and put your, you can all do this together with me. Hold it up in front of your face about six inches. And just settle to look at it. This takes. I won't even tell you. And just notice the lines on your hand, the textures, and go ahead and put it down. Put your hand down. So what was that like? Did anyone notice a shift there? Yeah, so this is actually uh, 30 seconds you can do a micro mindfulness pause. And there's another one where you put two hands together and you you simply blow cool air on that, and it, and it triggers like more awareness of your breath. And the idea is that these are activating different parts of your brain that aren't necessarily uh, engaged to be calming for yourself in the parasympathetic nervous system, which is pretty.